Good morning. I believe that we can stand now. <laughs> Let's stand together. And we're going to begin worshiping the Lord together by singing number 23 in the hymnal, Worthy of Worship. from Psalm 109, and we will be looking at verses 20 through 31. Let this be the Lord's reward to my accusers and to those who speak evil against my people. But you, O God, the Lord, deal with me for your name's sake. Because your mercy is good, deliver me, for I am poor and needy, and my heart is wounded within me. I am gone like a shadow when it lengthens. I am shaken off like a locust. My knees are weak through fasting, and my flesh is feeble from my lack of fatness. I also have become a reproach to them. When they look at me, they shake their heads. Help me, O Lord my God. O save me according to your mercy, that they may know that this is your hand, that you, Lord, have done it. Let them curse, but you bless. When they arise, let them be ashamed, but let your servant rejoice. Let my accusers be clothed with shame, and let them cover themselves with their own disgrace as with a mantle. I will greatly praise the Lord with my mouth. Yes, I will praise him among the multitude, for he shall stand at the right hand of the poor to save him from those who condemn him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are grateful this morning for your goodness and your kindness to us. We thank you, Lord, for the uh, provisions you give to us each day, Lord, and we're thankful this morning just to be able to have a place to come to and worship you freely here. 
And Father, we think of those this morning who are unable to be with us, and we lift them up to you, Lord. Some are away be, uh, on vacations. Most are coming back. But I pray, Father, that you'll watch over them, and I pray for those who are not feeling well this morning and unable to be out. And Lord, I lift up those who are shut in and uh, are unable to be here, and I pray for them in particular, Lord, that you will continue to bless them, protect them as they uh, go about their days uh, at home alone. Some of them are alone, Lord. So we just pray and lift them up to you and ask your blessing to please continue to be upon them. And Father, we thank you for your word this morning, and we pray that as we come together to worship you and to learn of you, I pray that uh, you would help us to set aside all the distractions of this week and help us, Lord, to worship you in spirit and in truth. And we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Be seated at this time. We now have a chance to sing what we just read from Psalm 109 to the tune of Am I a Soldier of the Cross? <clears throat> in the hymnal Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise.
number 10, immortal, invisible, God only wise, starting at verse 3 now. To all life thou givest, to both great and small, in all life thou livest, the true life of all. Blossom and flourish as leaves on the tree, and wither and perish, but not change in thee. Great Father, Welcome everyone out today. Several of you just coming back from vacations and things like that. It's great to have everybody together today. Uh, for the most part, a few people out, but uh, good to have all of us together. I want to read uh, a few portions of a letter just uh, to keep us aware of our missionaries. We do this on the second Sunday of the month. And the Hoblets are, are missionaries in Georgia, the, 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 uh, not the state, uh, the, the uh, country of Georgia. And um, so I want to read just a few things that they say here. They say, Dear friends and prayer partners, God has enabled us to plant five Georgian churches, either directly or indirectly, through a Georgian man, men and women we train and work and shoulder to shoulder with. One of the church, church plants is in a large village of 8,000 people uh, named Jvari. This whole region had never uh, had the gospel preached in it all the history of the world, except that the German missionary, that a German missionary passed through the area 20 years ago, told them about Jesus, but didn't stay to teach them more. They asked God to send someone to explain it in more detail. God answered their prayer by sending us. They now worship God every week in the church plant God enables, enabled us to establish. Later on then, he, they say, uh, he says, uh, we are continuing to work with Lini, our Indian doctor, to establish two Indian student fellowships. The students are here for six months and many come from a Hindu background where they worship many different gods. We preach the truth that Jesus is the only way, the truth, and the life and salvation. Over 200 attend these two Indian church plants. Many of these students come to Christ and are baptized. When they return home to practice medicine, they become tent-making missionaries, ministering to sick and dying patients. They work in hospitals and clinics, enabling them to earn enough money in their career to serve God without needing missionary financial support. Currently, we are planting a Farsi church and training a national pastor to shepherd these uh, new converts. They are fleeing Iran uh, by the hundreds to escape, to, is, uh, to escape Islam and persecution. Christians and their pastors are being imprisoned and even killed there. We have a wide open door for evangelism. It is such a blessing and gives us so much joy to lead them to Christ and help them to grow in the faith and knowledge of Christ. To date, approximately 30 of them have received Christ and followed him by being baptized. Um, July this past month, uh, of course this is this letter is a little bit old, but um, we, we again had our summer uh, children's Christian camp. Over 40 children attended, including two Muslim background children from Iran. Many Georgian children received Christ. Later on, he says, God has provided us with a mobile medical clinic through one of our supporting families. This ho hospital on wheels is so important and necessary for us. The villages we serve uh, in are extremely poor. Often 10 people live in one room with no running water. Lini, our Indian missionary doctor, uses the privacy of this mobile clinic to examine patients in the villages who often just suffer because there is no one to help them and provide treatment and medicine for them. Uh, later on, he says, we continue to hold regular worship services in our International Baptist Church. Generally, we have about 100 people in a, to a, in a tent that attend, uh, but during special meetings, we, we max out our building at 160 in attendance. 
He says later on, there are 7,000 villages here without single born again, without a single born again person. We are trying to reach them for Christ. Uh, um, and he said, this year we have had the opportunity to pass out many Samaritan purse boxes to children who live in the villages and have never heard the gospel. So obviously there's a lot going on. There's actually, if you want to read this letter in detail, I encourage you to do so. Uh, you can actually get their email and the letter should be out here. Uh, and um, there's lots, lots more that I didn't read. I just want to give you some of the highlights. That, the picture is the picture of the International Baptist Church that they are, uh, that they are uh, continuing to, to work with and, and grow. Um, lot, so a lot going on in the Hoblitz, uh, Hoblitz uh, missions efforts in Georgia. Georgia is, by the way, it's a very unique area. Um, he is right, by the way. I did some research in a missions project that I did when I was working on a, uh, one particular degree in, at BJ, and um, they, we were asked to research an unreached area, and, and Georgia is very unreached primarily because, um, one of the reasons is because they have a very unique language. And um, there are other missionaries besides the Hoblets that, that go there. The Hoblets don't know the language. They, it's really best to know the language if you can. Uh, I don't think they've been able to, 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 to grasp it, and they're doing the best they can without knowing the language. But there are others there as well that are doing, that, are doing, uh, that know the language and, and stuff. So um, a lot going on there in Georgia. Really important and helpful mission field in the 1040 window there where, where there's lots of, uh, lots of opportunity to share with people who have never even heard the gospel before and have not been, they would be considered technically unreached. So that's, that's great. So please keep the hoblets in prayer. All right, let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. And oh, actually, let me have the guys come up for the offering. And uh, if, you are, if you are here with us today and uh, you're visiting with us and you haven't filled out a visitor's card, if you do that, maybe drop that in the offering plate, that would be great. And let's pray together. Father, we thank you just for the privilege of gathering together this morning, and we thank you that you are a God who is worthy of our worship and our praise. We thank you that you are merciful, and you are one who, you are jealous for your own namesake, your word says in Psalms there. And um, you desire for us to honor and glorify you in all that we do and say, and the, one of the primary ways that you have called us to do that in this time period is to go into all the world and to preach the gospel to every creature and to make disciples. And we thank you, Lord, for the Hoblets and their, um, their work in, in the country of Georgia. And we pray, Lord, that you just continue to, to, we thank you for what you have been doing and the fruit that they have seen over there. We pray, Lord, that you would help them in continuing to spread the gospel and for churches to be planted and for people to be discipled. Lord, I pray that the gospel that is penetrating the hearts of people, um, we pray that it would take root and that it really would, that people really would come to Christ and be converted and grow and be discipled. Um, and uh, we pray that you would uh, prevent some of, the, some of the possible receiving of the gospel um, for other motives, such as different kinds of care that could be provided to them. And um, that's always a temptation there. So we thank you, Lord, that they're able, the hoblets are able to use uh, these different means to uh, make inroads into these villages and areas uh, to be able to give the gospel. But I pray, Lord, that you would, you would, your spirit would really work and that the gospel would do its work in the lives of these people um, and that uh, they truly would be discipled and, and churches would, would be planted all for your glory and for the furtherance of your kingdom. We pray for our church as well, Lord, that, that seeing what you're doing in the lives of our missionaries and around the world would motivate us to reach our community for Christ as well. And we think of the, some of the things that are coming up this fall uh, that hopefully will uh, continue to help extend our outreach into this community. And I pray that, Lord, it would ultimately, ultimately result in the gospel coming, making inroads in the hearts of people and people coming to Christ. And so we pray for that. We thank you for who you are, and we pray, Lord, that as we worship you this morning, that we would do so in a way that pleases you, that honors you, um, that you, uh, are, are, we are, you are enjoying our worship, and that we would enjoy our worship together as well. As we give our offerings this morning, we pray that you would 
Um, use them for your purposes, and we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.
We truly do serve a great and magnificent God, do we not? Now, in light of that, we, it's one, we wonder why sometimes then we, we are anxious and we are worried when we serve the kind of God that we do. You know, on that note, Jesus says that we are more valuable than the sparrows. We are more valuable than the grass. And he tells us in Matthew 6, 33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And those things that we are worried about, those things will be added to us. Let's go ahead and stand and sing number 411, Seek Ye First. go to our next song, number 599, Children Can Be Dismissed to Junior Church. Bibles and turn to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. And let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, as we enter into this text, a text that really should direct our hearts and our minds to thinking on things that are eternal. I pray, Lord, that you would um, just calm our hearts and calm our minds, help us to put away the distractions that so easily invade our thinking, and help us, Lord, just to really glean the truth from your word this morning, a truth that can make such an incredible difference in our lives, a life that can be hidden in Christ and for the fur- be really for the furtherance of your kingdom. 
And so we ask, Lord, for that now and help us to be receptive to your word and to hear your word. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. We as American citizens <clears throat> travel all, many of us travel different places, even all over the country and all over the world. And one of the things that is uh, interesting as you travel is finding both the differences in, a, a, and the similarities. Uh, when I was uh, a few years ago, I went to Hong Kong. I'm looking forward to going back in January, Lord willing. And um, when I went over there, it's the other side of the world, and there were some things that were very, very similar. I, in fact, I was, I was amazed at how similar things were. Like, just people had, um, you know, normal jobs and families, and things, a lot of things were very similar. I'll tell you one of the things that was, surprised me how similar it was is that how everybody acts with their cell phone. Like, literally, down, I was going, you know, there's, very crowded in Hong Kong, and people are walking around like this with their cell phone everywhere. And uh, the missionaries told me that I was w with, they said, you know, we have a pro there's a, seems to be a problem over here with that, that everybody's kind of walking around with cell phones and they're not willing to pay attention to what they're going. I said, that is not, that is not an Eastern problem. That is a worldwide problem, apparently, because we have the same thing going over here. It's amazing how in human nature, there are certain things that are just very similar to each other. Uh, but there are other things that are very different. Uh, in, in Asia, certain various parts of Asia, you have issues like, like communism. Communism has an ideolo ideology, has a, has a worldview that is very different from our Western worldview. In communism, the people serve the government. They contribute to, for, the, for the good of the government. The way that we look at things in our country is that we serve, or the, the government serves us. At least that's the way it used to be. Um, very, very different in, in the way, in the worldview, in the way they think versus how we think. And the truth of the matter is, if you grew up in this, era, in this country and you, you espouse the ideals of this country, then when you go to another country, it isn't as though you may live in that country and learn to follow their customs, but you're not necessarily going to be able uh, to think exactly the way they think. And in, in fact, in some cases, you wouldn't want to think the way they think. Your goals are probably going to be a bit different than their goals. Your desires and your aspiration, aspirations may be as well in certain areas. When we get into the text this morning, what we're going to see is that the Apostle Paul is now going to bring us to the pinnacle of the truth that we have been learning in the book of Colossians. Of course, we have learned that Christ is all-sufficient and that we must keep him in our minds and our thinking as, as all-sufficient. And he is superior to all things and he is all-sufficient in all things. And we also learned that we have both died with Christ and resurrected with Christ. And with that in mind, we come to chapter 3, verse 1, and it says this, If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. So it says, first of all, if you, have, if you were raised with Christ. The word with, if could be actually translated since. Since you are raised with Christ, seek those things that are above. So what is he talking about here when he's talking about uh, being raised with Christ? This whole text here in verse 1 is telling us to persistently seek eternal results. But it's all based upon the idea that we are resurrected with Christ. In Ephesians chapter 2, it's explained this way, and it's explained as a present reality, that so, when someone comes to Christ, they are then resurrected. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4, it says, And God, who is rich in mercy because, he, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you, are, you have been saved, and raised us up together 
and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. This is a present reality, the way it's being worded here in Ephesians 2. He says that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, and of works lest any man should boast. You know those two verses. And then it says this, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God has raised us. He, we died with Christ, and then we are raised with Christ and we are to be raised with Christ. We are raised with Christ to walk in newness of life. It's a new life. It's a different life. Romans chapter 6, verse 4 says it this way: Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised, raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. It's a new life in Christ. So we are living in this world. And we're living in a culture where we're going to have to adjust to the culture. We're going to have to operate within the culture. But our thinking should be from another world. It should be a different world. It should be a different realm, a different place. We are pilgrims, if you will, in a foreign land. And Christ says that when you are pilgrims in a foreign land, remember to keep your focus on where you're from. And this is what the passage is saying. Chapter 3, verse 1. If then you are raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. It says to seek. The seek word is an interesting word. It's the idea of to keep on pursuing, to seek persistently, to continue to seek after. The word is used in Matthew chapter 7, verse 7, where it says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened unto you. In Romans chapter 2, verse 7, it says, Eternal life to those who, by patient continuance in doing good, seek for glory, honor, and immortality. But those who are self-seeking, and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath. We are to seek out. The idea here is to seek with the heart, to seek with the desires, to persistently pursue. We have lots of examples of this in Scripture, of persistently pursuing, and we have examples even in our, in our, in our world's history. Albert Einstein, for, for example, was dismissed from the school of Munich because he was thought to, it was thought to have, he was lacking interest in his studies. He next failed to pass an examination to enter a polytechnic school in Zurich. He became a tutor for boys in Zurich, a uh, boarding house, but was then soon fired. But with all of those setbacks, one after another, after another, after another, you know the result. Uh, Albert Einstein is one of the most influential men in our world's history. Another man by the new name of Lou Gehrig. It was said by Ty Cobb at the time where, when Lou Gehrig was playing baseball, he said, look at those piano legs. He'll never last. And by piano legs, he meant you know, thin, thin legs that are not very strong. He said that he'll never last. But with all his shortcomings, he set an all-time all record of 2,130 consecutive games until, as anybody in Maryland knows, Cal Ripken broke it uh, many years ago. You guys remember that when that happened? This was, this, this is, we celebrated the anniversary this week. It was like, how many years ago was that? Somebody, somebody know? It, a lot, but uh, I remember it like yesterday. Somebody has it, who's got it? 94, something like that? 94, the guy from not this area growing up knows the, knows the date. Okay, all right, yeah, anyway. All right, very good. All right, so uh, we need to seek after those things which are above. We need to be persistent. Persistent, seeking after. And folks, as you read biographies, you are going to find that those who have made significant accomplishments in life, there is setbacks and failures and then there is persistent moving forward toward goals. It is a constant thing that you see in life. It is very, it is 
very infrequent that you see someone who is, who is, pers persist uh, who is not persistent, who just everything kind of falls to him, and then he's successful. Now, folks, with that in mind, the same kind of persistence needs to, needs to be applied to another area. It's the things above. See what the text says? It says that we need to seek those things that are above. So what does he mean when he says those things are above? What is he talking about? In John chapter 8, Christ is talking to some folks who are asking him some questions, and he says to them, I, uh, I go away, and you will seek me, and, I, and will die in your sin. Where I am going, you cannot come. So these Jewish leaders said, to, said surely he will not kill himself. Will he, sit, since he said, where I am going, you cannot come. And he, he, would, uh, and he was saying to them, you are from below, I am from above. You are from this world. And below he didn't mean hell, below he meant here. You are from this world, I am not of this world. Christ clearly understood that he was, what was he? Well, he was not of this world. He came, he, he, he was born, he lived a perfect life, he rubbed shoulders, shoulders with people, he grew up in wisdom and stature and favor with God and men and all that, and yet he was from another world. And what Christ is saying, what the Lord is saying to do, what Paul is, is, is exhorting us to do, is to look at, is to, is to realize who we are and although we are living in the world, to constantly be pursuing something else, to be constantly pursuing the, the, the world above. And then we have an explanation more of what he's talking about here. It says where Christ is. So where Christ is now. And he says this, sitting at the right hand of God. So we are to constantly be pursuing something that is above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Well, what is he talking about? This phrase, sitting at the right hand of God, comes from Psalm 110, where it says that the Lord said unto my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion. Rule in the midst of your enemies. The Bible says in Mark chapter 10, verse 37, uh, the disciples were talking to Jesus, and they were getting around Jesus, and they said, Grant us that we may sit, one on your right hand, on, and the other on your left, in your glory. Back then in those days, the, the, person, the right hand was the place of privilege. It was the place of authority. It was the place of honor. And it says that Christ is now seated in the place of privilege, the place of authority, and the place of honor. What what Paul is leaning us toward is helping us to understand that Christ, although he will set up his kingdom on earth one day, and that will happen, there is a spiritual kingdom. Christ is working in his world now, and there is a spiritual authority that he ought to have over us where we now are seeking after the kingdom of God. This same word, seek, is the same word that's used in the book of Matthew, where he says, and we sang this, Matthew 6, 33, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. We are to be constantly seeking after the kingdom of God. The furtherance of God's kingdom we must constantly be seeking after. Can I ask you a question this morning? What are you seeking after? What is it that you, when you wake up in the morning, what is your first thought? When you go to bed at night, what is your last thought? What is, what is your default thinking as you go throughout your day? What is your default thinking? A lot of our thinking will tell us about where our affections lie, where our heart really is. I remember when I was first dating Elizabeth. I was a senior in college, and, and uh, I was fairly well enamored and twitter pated and all of that. I know you guys like that word. And, um, and I, could, I, I woke up in the morning, I was thinking about her. I'd be thinking throughout the day, and I'd be thinking about her. I'd go to, I, I, I would see, see, what I did my senior year was I did a lot of credits in my, junior, my freshman through junior year 
So I didn't have a lot of credit hours in my senior year, and then I found a girl. Um, I actually wasn't that well planned. It just worked out that way, and I was kind of glad it did. Well, um, what your default, you know, you, 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 you see if somebody's in love, they're like constantly thinking about this other person. It's on their mind all the time. They're, they can't stop thinking about somebody. Well, that's a good picture of what it ought to be when it comes to the kingdom of God and, and how we ought to focus on Christ, seeking persistently the kingdom of God. And the thing that we ought to understand about this first command, we're going to get to another command that's going to be more of a mental thing, but the first command that we have here is really telling us to shape our desires and our affections and our appetites. Do your desires, are, are your desires Christ's desires? Do you love to read the Word of God? Do you love to know more about who God is? Do you love to be with God's people? Do you desire... Uh, to, to be together, worshiping together with God's people? Do you desire to have time alone with the Lord? Are these kinds of desires things that you're cultivating? We must not believe the lie, folks, that our desires are fixed, that what we want is fixed, and it can't change. That's a lie. Our desires can be cultivated. They can be shaped one way or the other. And what God is saying to do here is to shape your heart in such a way that it desires heavenly things rather than earthly things. But in order to accomplish that, not only is our heart going to be shaped, our desire is going to need to be shaped the right way, it really is our mind is going to be, have to be singularly set on that. Notice what the next verse says. Set your mind on things above, not on the things on the earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Verse 2 particularly, set your mind on things above. The things above we've already established have to do with God's kingdom, with his work, with what he is doing. So we're to set our minds on things above. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. You know the verse. Holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And then it says, and do not be conformed to this world. But how do we keep from being conformed to the thinking of the world system? How do we keep from doing that? But be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. He says, if you're going to prove what's, what, that, what is the will of God, you must, your mind must be focused on the right kinds of things. You must be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Your mind's got to be focused on eternal things, eternal results. He's talking here about setting forth the habits of the mind. One particular preacher told of a, illustrated it this way. There was a, he had a young, he had a, a dog. Uh, his name was Bozy. It's an interesting name for a dog. But anyway, his name was Bozy. Bozy uh, was a dog who, uh, he, he said he would, he would play fetch with Bozy, take a tennis ball, and he'd play fetch with Bozy. Bozy loved this tennis ball. He would, the, the, the dog would go to sleep with a tennis ball. The dog, dog would wake up with a tennis ball. He was always focused on the, te on the tennis ball. He was always on his mind. If the tennis ball would go somewhere, the, 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 the dog would immediately be directed to go get that tennis ball. He was just attached to the tennis ball. His mind was focused on the tennis ball. That's a silly illustration, but the truth of the matter is that every area of our lives, we need to be con bring it into conformity to focus on Christ and to focus on eternal priorities. Our earthly priorities must come under the submission of, of heavenly priorities. Um, the text says it that way. It says, set your mind on things above, not on the things on the earth. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 18, it says, For many walk of whom I have told you often, and not tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross. Who are the enemies of the cross? Whose end is destruction whose God is their belly, whose glory is their shame, who set their mind 
on earthly things. You want to talk about an extreme, extreme contrast. On one hand, you have the possibility of setting your mind on, on heavenly things. Setting your mind on otherworldly priorities. The other side of that is someone who is entirely selfish, whose mind is entirely on earthly things, whose goals are entirely this world. And are we not guilty of this? We think of our jobs. We think of our families. We think of our spouses, our kids. If we're not careful, we can think of them in terms of only what is here on earth, only the goals that are here on earth. We can make this, we can really make this uh, 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 mistake with our children. We educate our children. Why do we educate our children? Why do we send our children to good schools? Why are we concerned that they get their homework done? Why is this the case? Why? Well, folks, if it's the case just so they can make money and have a good life, then that is an earthly goal. There must be something more. We ought to educate our children to equip them to serve the Lord. We ought to educate our children so that they're equipped to do whatever God wants them to do for eternal rewards. We ought to direct their thinking and their lives to do what will please God, what will please Christ. There must be a heavenly ultimate goal for us as Christians. If you're working your job, it's easy to do your nine to five or whatever, to do your work and jo your job to get the paycheck, to make money, to pay the bills. Folks, there's got to be something more. There has to be more than just making money and paying the bills and doing those things. It must be that I am serving God by, by doing what I'm doing, by working hard, by, by, by doing everything I'm doing heartily as unto the Lord and not unto men, the Bible says. We must have eternal priorities that are submitted. Our earthly priorities must be submitted to heavenly priorities. So important that we have these things right. Why? Because we are from another world. We are in this world, Christ prayed to his his father in John 17. But we are not of this world. Now with all of that in mind, we quickly then move to verses 3 through 4. But to understand verses 3 through 4, we need to understand that actually there is a shift in Paul's thinking. Paul sets up a different way of thinking, and he'll do this a lot in his epistles, where it, there is an already, not yet way of thinking. Let me explain it this way. Let's think, of, um, let's think of salvation. If you know Christ, when you come to Christ as your, uh, come to Christ as your and, and, you, and you accept him as your Lord and Savior, are you saved? Yes and not yet. Yes, you are saved. You have a relationship with God. But you have not fully, your body is not, you have you, you're not fully been saved. <laughs> In other words, you are saved, you're redeemed, and yet you're not completely redeemed. That's why the Bible says we are waiting the day of redemption. Are you redeemed or are you not? Yes, we are redeemed, but there's a sense in which we are not completely redeemed. We have gone through justification. We're declared righteous. We are free from the, from the power of sin even, but we are not freed from the presence of sin. So there is an already, not yet kind of thinking. And the, this is the case here. He has already said that we have been resurrected. But now these two verses are anticipating a future resurrection. Look at the two verses. He says, picking up in verse 3, For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ and God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 20, it says, Therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, who has, who has though living in the world, uh, do you subject yourselves to regulations? He's talking about if you die with Christ. But then you have, in chapter 2, verse 12, it actually talks about being buried with him in baptism, and then in which you also were raised with him through the faith and the working of God who raised him from the dead. 
But we need to understand also that there is a future resurrection that we're looking forward to. In other words, we have been raised from the dead, but now we also are looking to a day where we will, be ri- we will rise from the grave again and that we will, be, we will experience glory with God. Do you see what it says there? It says that. Verse 4, Then you also will appear with him in glory. Now that gives us the question then becomes, what do we do now? We've got this period. We've got this period between where we're saved and the time that we will rise from the grave. We will appear with him in glory. So what, what happens now? I had a question after yesterday's mess, or yesterday, last Sunday's message. And it, or not, it was sort of a comment. More, it was a good discussion. I, by the way, I love co- questions and comments, most of them. Um, uh, after, after my, uh, my messages. Uh, I love it when you come to me and, and ask questions, that kind of thing. Uh, and this person had a comment about the fact that we are, the Bible actually declares us that we will be conformed to the image of Christ. It's not something that we, we have to do. It's something that will happen, that we will one day, when we see him, we'll be like him, for we'll see him as he is. We are going to be conformed to the image of Christ. And that truth and the fact that we are saved, like it's like, what do we do in between? <laughs> maybe, maybe you've heard it this way. What do we do with our dash? What do we do but in, this, in this lifetime period between these two? And the answer to that, folks, is found in this verse. Verse 3, it says, For, your li- you, for you died, and your life is hidden with Christ and God. Now catch this. Now Paul is saying that we are buried with Christ now. And he is saying that our life is hidden with Christ. Now what does that mean? What does it mean that our lives are hidden with Christ? Well, first we need to understand what it means when it says for you, you, you are dead, you, are, you have died. In Romans chapter 6, verse uh, it explains this, and we covered this a little bit last week, but it says this, For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we die with Christ, we believe that we also will live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, died no more, death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that, is died, that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey the lusts thereof. Clearly from this text, we see, number one, what does it mean to be hidden with Christ? Well, it means that we're freed from sin, that we no longer have to sin. We're no longer under the power of sin any longer. But more than that, folks, I want us to understand something about this passage. This is this idea of being hidden with Christ has this concept of mystery and then one day being revealed. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 26, it says, the mystery which has been hidden, same word, hidden from the ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to the saints. To them God will, willed to make known that what are the riches of his glory the mystery among Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So what does it mean that we are hidden in Christ? It means there is this, this word actually has to do, it's the tense that it's in has to do with a reality that happened in the past that continues into the present. And a good passage to go to to help us with this is Matthew 27, or I'm sorry, Psalm 27. In Psalm 27, it says this, For in the time of trouble, you shall hide me in his, he shall hide me in his pavilion. Same idea. In the secret place of his tabernacle, he shall hide me. He shall set me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. Therefore, I will offer sacrifice of joy in his tabernacle. I will sing Yes, I will sing praises to him. This word has the idea of protection. 
has the idea of hiding someone away from the storm. You have storms that are happening in the Bahamas and uh, 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 the Carolinas right now and all of that. Hiding from the storm, it has to do with a kind of a protection. We are hidden in Christ. We are protected. We are protected. We are secure. There is this place of safety that we have in Christ. In 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 6, it says, When the men of Israel saw that they were in danger, then the people hid in caves and thickets and rocks and holes and in pits. It, it's this idea of hiding for the sake of protection. So what does it mean that we are hidden in Christ? This is such an important concept to understand. Our position is that we are hidden in Christ. We are buried with him. We are protected in Christ. We're protected from, from the, the noise of the culture. We're protected from the things that others have to go through, the stress, uh, the problems. Now, what I mean by that is this. We all go through problems. We all go through stress. We all go through difficulties in life. But there is a sense in which the way that the person who hides in Christ is protected in a way that others are not. We are living in a fallen world. And there are storms and there are battles and there are struggles and there are problems. But we are under the protection of Christ. I'd like you to take your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 11, verse 27. Matthew chapter 11. I'd like everybody to take their Bible and turn there. This is such an important concept. It's one that actually in the Sunday school hour, if you were in Quiet and Noisy Soul, he covered these ver this verses. But really, this gets at the heart of what it's saying here when it says that Christ is, uh, that we are hidden in Christ. Christ said in this passage, all things have been delivered to me by my Father. And no, no one knows the Son except the Father. Nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Then he says this, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. We are to hide. We, we are hidden in Christ. But just like, just like our position in Christ, just like we are freed from sin, but still sin, just like we are redeemed, and yet we can still sin, just like that's the case we can be hidden in Christ and still not experience it. You ever feel that you are unprotected from Christ, or, uh, from the world? That you are, you are left to flap in the wind, so to speak, in the midst of the trials and the storms and the struggles of life? There seems to be no solace. There seems to be no protection. There seems to be no... no uh, uh, no clarity about things. There need no root. There's no anchor. Christ says, "You are hidden in Him." But the reality is, we have to experience it, folks. The way that we experience it is by doing the previous two verses. The way that we experience, the way that we stay hidden in Christ. You think of the song, Hiding in Thee. A blessed rock of ages, I'm hiding in Thee. There are other songs that we sing, hymns that we sing about the being hidden in Christ. Folks, the way that we experience what is true is that we've got to set our affections on things above. Do you understand, folks, what's at stake here? If we continue to set our minds on earthly things, if we continue to pursue earthly priorities instead of heavenly priorities, if we don't submit 
our earthly roles under the headship of a heavenly Christ, if we choose not to do that, then we will not experience what is truly ours in Christ. We will be hidden with Christ, but we won't experience the protection of Christ. We will be hidden with Christ, but we will not experience the rest in Christ. Christ says, come to me. Take my yoke upon you. What's Christ's yoke? The heavenly things. What's Christ's yoke? The eternal pursuits. What's Christ's yoke? The kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom of God. And what? All of these things will be added to you. So often we are seeking all of these things and we're not seeking the kingdom of God. So in final application of all this, no, well, first of all, notice this finally in, in Colossians chapter 3. You have this death burial, and then this final resurrection pictured here. And notice in verse 4 it says, When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. Did you catch that? It says Christ who is our life. Do you see, it? Do you see your life that way? Paul said it this way, Colossians chapter 2, verse 20, Therefore, if you die with Christ... Um, I'm sorry, Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, it says, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we eagerly wait for the, Savior, uh, uh, for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed like his glorious body, according to the working which was able to, to even to subdue all things in himself. Our life is in Christ. Our life is Christ. It's been, it's been redeemed for Christ. Christ is our life. Are we not living in a world that tempts us so much to make our life the way we want it to be? If you just think about social media, or you think about some of the, some of the avatar kinds of programs that are out there, and the idea that I can, I can orchestrate my life the way I want it to be. If I can have everything the way I want it, just set it all up the way I want it to be, and we have, and our whole world is pursuing life that way. I want what I want the way I want it set up. If everything could be exactly the way that I want it to be set up, then I'll have rest. Then I'll have peace. Then I'll have what I want. But it's never enough. Never. If, you, if, we can't, if we can just learn this, you will never be able to set your life up the way you want it and have rest that way because your life is hid with Christ. We must submit our lives to Christ. Instead of orchestrating our lives in the way that we want everything to be set up the way that we want it to be set up and everything will be... Let's just live our lives day by day. Sufficient today is the evil thereof. And when we do that, and when we take one day at a time, and we gaze our eyes upward, and we take the earthly circumstances of our lives, and we submit them to, our, to godly thinking, to heavenly thinking, then we are protected in Christ. We stay hidden in Christ. And one day... We will rise with Christ. We will be revealed. We ought not seek honor this side of heaven. We are, our glory is not this side of heaven. But our glory is with Christ. And one day we will be like Him, for we will see Him as He is. And we will glory in Christ's glory in us, the hope of glory. Are we under the protection, and just in concluding remarks here, are we under the protection of Christ and live in Christ. If we are, then we must do two things. It's really two, just two. Persistently seek eternal things. And secondly, we must mentally focus on eternal things. Persistently seek eternal things and mentally focus 
on eternal things. And then our lives, we will experience the reality of being hidden in Christ. And we can look forward to the day where we will rise with Christ in glory. Let's pray. Father, we pray that you would help us as we, as we, it's so easy to say these things and it's something else entirely to do them on a consistent basis. The reality is we can all agree that this is what we ought to do and our minds ought to be focused on Christ and yet on Monday morning, the battle starts. I pray, Father, that you would help us that our that eternally that our that our, our we would learn to set our gaze on eternity so that the earthly pursuits are all submitted to that may we know the rest in Christ may we know the peace in Christ when we take his yoke on us and we learn of him. And we find rest for our souls. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.